have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus at chapter 18. <clears throat> we are continuing our way through the wilderness wanderings section of this book. And we've been, remember, we've been looking at this as pictures of our lives, just as their salvation from slavery to Egypt is a picture of our salvation from slavery to sin through Jesus Christ. So their wilderness wanderings, their life in the wilderness is a picture of our life as we wander in the wilderness of this world. These stories are pictures of our own stories as we seek to live as children of God, following after Christ in the wilderness of this life. Last week, we looked at the picture that we saw in the rest of chapter 17 of balancing, uh, fighting with all that we are by faith and praying to our Heavenly Father to win the battles for us. So let's keep moving, and we're going to see another picture in Exodus 18. <clears throat> Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The name of the other was Eleazar, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses and the wilderness where he is encamped at the mountain of God. When he came, and when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and, your, and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for, the, for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good the Lord had done to Israel and in, in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered his people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they, had dealt, they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was, going, that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them known to, in the way in which they should walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times." Every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure. And all this people will also go to their place in peace. <clears throat> so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we have before you your word this morning. Lord, may I treat it properly, faithfully, you and what you have given us here. Lord, we pray that you would solidify the truth. We pray that you would correct any failings I may introduce and that you would do all of that <clears throat> for your glory and our good. Amen. So one of the things that is often a, a source of conflict between Christians is how we are to live as Christians in this world. That is, how we are to balance living as Christians and living in this world that is not our home. The, this, this debate is often summed up as the relationship between Christ and culture. What should that look like? And this debate has been going on ever since the beginning, of the, of the beginning of the church. And there are all sorts of books written about this with all sorts of theories about this debate. In fact, often much of our conflict actually has this debate behind it or, or how we understand this balance behind it, even if we haven't thought about it deeply. In some ways, it actually would be easier if God had made us into a nation like Israel or like they will soon be. And we're a nation with our own laws that are directly from God and the world way out there, but not directly around us or among us. Now, when I say easier, I mean in the sense of knowing more clearly how we are to relate to that world around us. It's not, it wouldn't necessarily be easier to live it out. Yet, unlike the Hebrews, we are not called as a nation, but a church, as, as citizens of God's kingdom living among many nations. We are always foreigners, strangers, exiles, wherever we are, trying to be salt and light wherever we are. As we heard earlier in Jesus's prayer, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And the Bible gives us lots of help on this topic, but it doesn't really tell us exactly how we are to balance Christ and culture. That's why, that's why Christians who truly take the Bible seriously and truly see it as their highest authority in matters of faith and Christian life can still have disagreements on this topic. Yet the Bible does help us with general principles and examples and descriptions of people seeking to live out this balance faithfully. That's what we have in our passage. We don't have a full theology of the balance. One chapter in scripture and one sermon certainly would not be enough to try to get out all those details. Yet what we do have here is a picture of what that looks like in the life of Moses. Again, it's not a full picture. It's just one instance in Moses' life. But it's a helpful picture. It's helpful because it's another aspect of learning to live faithfully in the wilderness as we head to our true home following after Jesus. And as we mentioned way back in the beginning of these sermons on the wilderness wandering section, when Jesus redeems us and we put our faith in him, he doesn't immediately take us home to heaven. I mean, obviously. And as we heard in his prayer that he prays earlier, he actually specifically says he does not pray that the Father would take us out of the world. He prays for our protection, and then he sends us into it. Like the Hebrews were sent into the desert. And this balance of Christ and culture is another aspect of being sent into the wilderness of this life. And again, this passage definitely does not answer all the questions. I'm not going to answer all the questions today that you may have about this. Yet it does give us some important principles that we need to see and on which we can meditate. First, the foundational identity that we have. Second, telling our stories. And third, learning from general revelation. So first, Moses shows us something foundational about our identity here in the wilderness of this life. In the first part of the story, we hear that Jethro and Moses' family are coming to him, and Moses specifically tells us the names of his sons and why he named them that, which is really important. Now first, I want to caution us as we read this. There are commentators who read this and a couple other passages and then conclude that Moses and Zipporah must have had a terrible relationship and that Moses was probably not a very good husband or father. In fact, there are a few rabbis that try to argue that Moses had divorced Zipporah. That comes from speculation about why Moses had sent them to Jethro. And I just want to caution us against such speculation, both here and in other places in Scripture. Moses' relationship to his family is not at all clearly described in these books because they're not about Moses' personal life. So we shouldn't jump to any conclusions. 
I mean, the explanation of them being sent to Jethro could be as simple as they were very close to Jethro when they were at Horeb, because they were, and Moses knew that Jethro would want to see them. I mean, if, if I'm driving up I-85 north through Georgia, I'm close to my family, and I'm probably going to stop in, even if it's just for a few minutes. So there's no good reason for us to think that Moses was estranged from his family or, or, some, or neglected his duties as a husband and a father. But interestingly here, Moses tells us the names of his sons and why he gave them those names. Now, why would he do that here? Well, I don't know if I can tell you every reason why for certain, but I can tell you that in these names, Moses is revealing the foundational truths that he sees and believes about himself. He's showing us the core truths that he believes about himself and those beliefs, that identity, that influences everything that he does as he lives in the world. Let's look at those. He names his first son Gershom, which is in Hebrew sounds like the word for sojourner. And he says that's because he himself is a sojourner, a stranger in a foreign land. Now, that was the name that he had given Gershom way back in Exodus chapter 2 when he was in exile from Egypt. But how much more true is that of him now that he is wandering in the desert? And he reaffirms that here probably because he's claiming that truth about himself now. He's a wanderer, a stranger. He is not in his true home. And his second son, he names Eleazar, which means God is my help. And he tells us why in verse 4, because God saved him, delivered him from Pharaoh. And again, that's probably directly referring to that, that time where he was running from Pharaoh. But again, how much more true is that of him now, that they have left Egypt completely and are wandering in the desert? And again, he reaffirms that here, probably because he's reclaiming that truth about himself. God is his helper, his deliverer. So let's put those two things together. I am a stranger in a foreign land, but God is my help and deliverer. That's how Moses sees himself. That's two of the core truths that define and that he believes about who he is and define the identity as he sees himself. And it influences how he lives his life. And that's also true about the Hebrews as well. That identity fits them just as well as it fits Moses. In fact, that may be why Moses reaffirms it here in writing. He's reminding them that this is true of them, not just him. And church family, this is essential to our identity as well. In our New Testament reading that Roger read for us, we saw in Jesus' high priestly prayer these things about our identity. In fact, it might, be helpful, it might be helpful to keep your, your finger in Exodus 18 and flip over to John 17, because we're going to look at that for a few minutes. Jesus says there that we are given to him out of this world by the Father. That's verse 6. In fact, seven times in just 6 to 19, he says that we are his. That means that we are no longer of this world, just as Jesus isn't of the world. Verse 17. So you see, when we put our faith in Christ and believe in him. He claims us as our own, and he transfers us out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom. That's Colossians 1.13. So that means that this world is now no longer our home. We are now strangers here. That's why Peter calls us strangers and exiles in our confession of faith that we heard earlier. No matter what nation or culture we live in, we are strangers in this world, just like the Hebrews were. Yet also, keep looking in Jesus' prayer. We're not just strangers, but we're not just taken out of the world, but sent into the world. Verse 18, just as God sent the Hebrews into the desert. We're strangers, but we're still here by the command of Christ. And you, we're also not here alone. God is our help and a deliverer. That's something else that Jesus reaffirms there in John 17. He tells us that we are kept by the Father and protected from the evil one, verses 11 and 15. So we may be strangers here, but God is keeping us, sustaining us, delivering us, strengthening us. And you know what else would we expect from our heavenly Father who loves us as he loves Jesus, if he keeps his children here in a world that's not their home, he is not going to leave them alone. Look, if you're feeling alone, and latch on to this truth, because you have been adopted and given to Jesus, you are never alone. 
You're never truly alone. Just because God is always your help and your deliverer, just like he was for Moses. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that truth in the mornings before we go out into our days so that we know who we really are. We are not what our jobs or social media or news or, or our family or friends, even them, what they say we are. We are children of God, of the God of the universe. We are strangers in this world, but we are helped by him. That is at the bottom of who we are. It's like the apple in the jar of, uh, we were talking about in the kids' lessons earlier. And again, can you see how this would influence how we live in this world? We are strangers here. This world is not our home. So we should not get comfortable or love this world too much. And yet, we're sent into the world by him, so we're also not just supposed to com check out completely either. Our future and our hope do not depend on the political and social fluctuations of this unstable world, so we don't have to get desperate when things don't go our way or do sinful things to try to get our way. And yet we're also still here to be a blessing in the ways that we can by being salt and light wherever he has placed us. That identity affects how we balance Christ and culture, and it affected Moses. And we can see that actually in the next two points. Because after Moses gives his identity, he starts telling, he tells the story of God's great work to Jethro, the story of what God has done for him. Now Jethro comes and Moses greets him. And again, don't read too much into that and think, ooh, Moses doesn't greet Zipporah first. There must be some tension there. No. Moses is just observing the social norms of his culture, which required him to greet his father-in-law first. Yet notice how Moses does it. He goes out to meet Jethro. He defers to Jethro by going out to meet him. Now, Moses is the leader of a nation now. And as that important leader, he could have simply stayed in his tent and invited Jethro into him. But instead, he goes out, and he even bows to Jethro. And why would he do that? Because he doesn't need to fuel his own pride by showing off his own importance. He's secure in who he is as a stranger helped by God. And that makes him humble, makes him kind. As one commentator put, religion doesn't destroy good manners. To be a faithful Christian means to be a faithful and good husband or wife, father or mother, employee, citizen of whatever nation we're a part of. Moses is being faithful to the ancient Near Eastern standards of respect and, and honor, and that's why he greets Jethro first. Yet after that, he takes Jethro in his tent, and what does he do? That humble hospitality that he shows Jethro opens the door for him to tell Jethro the story of all that God has done. All, he tells Jethro everything God has done, his salvation, the hardships, the faithfulness of God, his deliverance, all of it. It must have been a pretty long conversation. But look at the results of it. Jethro rejoiced, he blesses the Lord, and he even makes a confession of faith in verse 11. Now, this is another place where we need to be careful. We don't know the state of Jethro's faith before this. The Bible tells us that he was a priest of Midian, which could mean that he was a pagan, but since it never really says anything negative about Jethro, it, it, we don't know that for sure. It could also mean that he had a very vague and unsophisticated belief in Yahweh and maybe some confusion about other gods, or maybe he really was just a full-on pagan. Who knows? Yet here, we see him confess faith in Yahweh as the true God and even make sacrifices to him. He would, so whatever his belief was before this, he has confirmed faith here and to the point of offering sacrifices for the forgiveness of his sins. All that... Because Moses shows him humble hospitality according to the standards of the culture of the time and tells him the stories of God's great work in his life. And church family, here we can see an example of how we can have an impact on the non-Christians around us in the wilderness. It's really just an example of speaking the truth in love like Paul and John talk about in the New Testament because Moses' identity was in the fact that he was a stranger in a foreign land but helped and delivered by God, he didn't need to impress Jethro with his importance or exert his authority or his desires. And also Jethro's opinion ultimately didn't matter. So he could tell, he wasn't have to be, didn't have to be afraid to tell Jethro the truth of God's work in his life, no matter how Jethro might respond. 
Instead, he was simply free to share, to, 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 he was simply free to greet Jethro and to treat him as greater and to tell him what God has done in his life. In church family, when we are secure in who Jesus has made us, children of God, strangers in this world, but helped by God, we'll be free to tell our stories about this too. Moses didn't need to impress Jethro. And if we know who we are, that we are valued, that we are loved by God, the Father, as he loves Jesus, that this world isn't our true home, but we do have a true home coming. If we know that, well, we don't, we're not going to feel like we need to impress those around us. Our egos do not need to be fed by their approval. Instead, we can just be humble and, and love them and show them kindness, whatever that looks like, so they would feel valued and respected by us. <clears throat> Maybe that means inviting them to our homes for meals. Maybe it means helping them out in their yard or with their work, even though uh, you, know, you probably could spend all your time focusing on your own. Maybe it means listening respectfully, respectfully listening to their opinions on social or political matters and not immediately trying to show them why they're wrong. However we do it, we value them and show them more, value them more than ourselves because we don't need to feed our egos with their approval or how they would respond because we know who we are by God's grace in Jesus Christ. Yet they also need to hear the stories, our stories of God's great work in our lives, the gospel. And Moses could, could have talked about how hard things has been. He could have talked about how, how much the people complained. He could have talked about how tough it was to be a leader. He could have focused on the negative and complained, but he doesn't. He tells Jethro the stories of God's great works. And what we need to see from that, I think, is, is pretty simple. We should be telling one another and the non-Christians in our lives the stories of God's great work in our lives and in salvation. Remember, their wilderness wanderings is a picture of our own. One of the ways that we wander faithfully is to tell the stories of God's greatness. Jesus has redeemed us from our sin, and he continues to sustain us and provide for us. So we have stories. I can tell the story of God's incredible love and provision through all of you, for my family, for the past couple of months as Gabriel has been healing. It is a wonderful story of God's love and comfort and care carried out through his people. And it's a story that has really very little or no equivalent in the lives of the non-believers that I know. They don't have a family like this. There's probably a lot of stories we can tell, and when they are God-centered stories, like Moses's were, God uses them. To, for us and in others, it, the combination of that humble kindness and that God-centeredness, stories of what God has done that we see in Moses, has incredible effects on us and on those around us. It shows God how thankful we really are. It shows others. It helps others to see what God has done. It spreads joy. It helps others to learn to look for that in their own lives. It confirms faith. Or like with Jethro, it can show God's greatness to someone and bring them to faith. It, it shows how much greater our true home is than this world. It glorifies God. So many other things. Tell the stories of God's great work in your life. It might be scary or embarrassing to do so, especially with non-Christians, especially like Bill had talked about earlier, especially with family or with some friendship that we're afraid of losing. It's hard. Yet that is where we need to come back and rest in this identity that Jesus has made, that identity that Moses shows us here. We are his. We are children of God. We are strangers in a foreign land, and God is our help. If all of that is true, then the opinion of that other person really doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about their opinion. And yet also, we can trust God with that relationship. He's caring for that relationship. We can trust his sovereign care over it. He gives the story the impact he wants. All he requires us is, is faithfully, humbly telling it and trusting him with the rest. So that's one of the ways that Moses shows us how the identity that he has in Christ helps, impacts his life in the wilderness. There's another way that we see here. and Because when, when we know that we're strangers in this world but helped by God, we can learn from general revelation. The story takes 
a rather unexpected turn. You know, Jethro has just confessed faith, so we were, might expect Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Moses to start teaching Jethro. But actually, the reverse happens. Jethro sees how Moses has organized the judgment of the Hebrews, and he tells Moses that it is unwise and unsustainable. He even gives Moses a system for how he should do it. Now, again, we need to be careful of what we make of this passage. We can't draw too strong or too many conclusions from this passage about systems of church or civil government. While there is great wisdom here, and Moses implements it, it's still a descriptive passage. And so we need to be cautious about what prescriptive ideas we try to draw from it. Yet at the same time, what I think we can see and learn from is Moses' attitude here and how he is willingness, his willingness to learn from general revelation. Now, when I say general revelation, what I mean by that is how God reveals his general truth through nature and through the wisdom of human beings. That's contrasted with special revelation where God shows his specific truth about himself, his plans, his desires, his work of salvation through speaking to his people. God spoke directly to Moses and Moses wrote it down. God spoke through the other authors of scripture and they wrote it down. So for us today, this is his special revelation. Is the Bible, he speaks to us through the Bible and it is, as Paul says in 2 Timothy, breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped or complete, equipped for every good work. Yet even though God spoke directly to Moses, he wasn't afraid to learn from the common wisdom of general revelation through Jethro. He didn't feel that he had nothing to learn from this priest of Midian. Though God spoke literally directly to him, he even knew that it was perfectly fine for him to use that common wisdom in the lives of God's people. All of that is true because he knows that he is a stranger in this world, but helped by God. Yes, he is a stranger, but it's in this world. So he can and still learn, and can and should learn from the common wisdom of this world, general revelation. And church family, that's a principle that we can learn from this story too. Just because we do have God's word does not mean that we cannot learn from general revelation or shouldn't learn from it. The Bible is the only way that we learn about God's specific plans, his salvation, and his desires for his people. Yet as we implement those things in everyday life, we can and should learn from good common wisdom, as Moses did here. Moses had to know what the standards of hospitality were so that he could show humble kindness and respect to Jethro. And he learned that from the culture around him. Moses could learn about organizing a community from Jethro, which he does. Now, those two things, Moses had to, had, had to test by the perfect standard of God's word. But if it's in line with those, then it's generally within the realm of faithfulness in the wilderness. And here, Jethro makes it clear that the wisdom that he gives him is not contradictory to God's word or call on Moses' life. He would still represent the people, verse 19, still train them, verse 20, still uphold the highest standards, verse 21, and still be the final judge as God had intended for him to be at this time in verse 22. Now, church family, there's, there's a lot of nuance in this discussion, and I'm not going to answer all of those questions today. This balance is sometimes hard to strike because it isn't necessarily abundantly clear. When it comes to the content of salvation, worship, the Christian life, God's word is our only source of truth. Yet that can still, we can still gain much wisdom from general revelation and how we implement those things. For example, in worship, we don't get to add anything else to what God has commanded us to do in his word, but we can use good common wisdom and how we implement those things. It's good common wisdom in our culture for me to try to keep sermons to 30 to 35 minutes. So that's what I try to do. It's good common wisdom in our culture and at our time to continue to stream our services for, for those who are shut in or sick. So we still do. Or for another, for example, God tells us to be kind and respect the non-Christians around us. And yet we learn how to do that from the standards of the culture in which we live. And much of the time, those things do not conflict with God's word, so we can and should abide by them. Again, church family, this probably brings up 
a lot more questions than it answers. I actually hope, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about this week is I hope this maybe strikes some conversations between all of you, and I'm happy to have those conversations too, about the nuances of this. Yet what I want us to see here for now is that because Moses knew who he was, he, at the core of who he is, like the apple in the jar, from the children's lesson. Because he knew that, he was not too proud or too fearful to learn from good common wisdom and apply it. And since we are Christ, yet sit into this world, we can do the same. We are strangers, yes, but in this world. So we are not above learning from the wisdom that we can find there. Even Jesus wasn't. Luke 2.52 and Hebrews 5.8 tell us that he learned and grew in wisdom because of his experiences in this world. And if we are truly helped by God, another part of that identity, then we can measure that common wisdom against the perfect standard of God's word. We can do our best to make a wise choice, and then we can trust God with the rest and trust him with those Christians that might disagree with us. So do you see now why I said in the beginning that this, is a, this passage is a picture of balancing Christ and culture that we see here in Moses' life? It's not a full picture, doesn't Definitely doesn't give us everything we need to, we might want to know, but I think it's a helpful one. It does not iron out all the details or the way, ways we might disagree, but I think it's a, still a helpful picture because it shows us the importance of that foundational identity, you know, the apple in the jar here. And it shows us then two examples of balancing Christ and culture, living out that identity as we seek to be salt and light wherever we are. <clears throat> it doesn't answer all our questions, but it gives us helpful insight and some principles on which to meditate and think about. It gives us principles that we can perhaps humbly discuss amongst one another as we seek to do this together, as we seek to be faithful to our Savior and King, who has made us not of this world anymore, but has still sent us into it. So let me pray. Father, I pray that you would... Help us to rest in who you have made us in Jesus Christ. And that that solid, unchangeable identity, that that would make us strong and humble and kind and gentle and confident as we try to live faithfully to you in this world. Lord, help us to go to your word and to measure everything that we learn in this world against it. And yet help us to be humble and, and, and courageous enough to learn from the things around us and to apply those things wisely. Help us to have good conversations amongst each other on how we do that and learn from one another, from the wisdom that you have given all of us as your body and your church. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll stand with